Good afternoon. On behalf of Kappa Delta Pi Education Honorary and Ball State Student Education Association, I would like to thank you all for coming. Our guest speaker, Provost Cook, Vice President of Academic Affairs, has a long list of credits to his name. He received his PhD from Northwestern and his Bachelor of Arts from Illinois State University. His previous positions include Chairman, Department of Economics and College of Arts and Sciences at Illinois State University, and previous to Ball State, was Dean of Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Rhode Island College. Provost Cook has been at Ball State since August of 1980. The Provost has also held positions at Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island, University of Grenoble, France, and California State University. Provost Cook has also been honored with grants from the National Science Foundation, German Marshall Fund, Illinois Board of Higher Education, and the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. He is also listed in Who's Who in the Midwest and Who's Who in the United States. His academic specialties are industrial organization and pricing, microeconomic theory, applied econometrics, and economics of education. Provost Cook has also authored or co-authored four books, five monographs, and over 40 articles. In respect to excellence in higher education, he has published the following. Salary Equity Programs in Academe, Where Do We Stand Now? Benefits, Costs, and Finance of Public Higher Education, Internal Rates of Return in Student Enrollments, and Collective Bargaining, Student-Teacher Ratios, and Teacher Salaries. And now I would like to present Provost Cook speaking on excellence in higher education. Thank you very much. I'm uh, glad to be here and talk about this topic. Uh, when one today uses words like excellence and quality and rigor and standards, these are words that appear with amazing regularity in contemporary discussions of the state of higher education. No less than an organization than the American Council on Education has asserted that quality maintenance is now higher education's principal challenge. And they've, in fact, issued a volume by the same name that purports to outline how colleges and universities should respond to that challenge. But what is excellence? What is quality? How do we know when we have them? The answers to these questions are not immediately obvious. For while most academics talk about excellence and quality, few have ever bothered to try to define these terms. So it's not surprising that individuals both inside and outside of higher education encounter some difficulty when they attempt to apply these important, though rather elusive, concepts. We can make some headway in this area if we take a moment or two to sketch the major approaches to measuring excellence and quality that have most often been pursued in higher education. Throughout, we will use the words excellence and quality in a virtually synonymous fashion, primarily because that is how academics use these terms. As Lewis Salmon has noted, excellence probably comes closest to connoting what is usually viewed as quality in higher education, a consensus that an institution or a program is superior. Well, let's start. The traditional approaches to measuring quality and excellence seem to me to be five in number. One, there is what I will call the nihil, nih, nihilist approach. Second, the reputational approach. Third, the resources approach. Fourth, the outcomes approach. And fifth, the value-added approach. These classifications will provide a little bit of framework for my discussion. Now, the nihilist approach to quality is as following. Many academics, I think, reject out of hand the notion that excellence and quality be can, can be defined or measured with any precision. The proponents of this view seemingly reflect the frustration of the plaintive voice who, in what has to be one of the lesser known literary gems of our time, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, observed, quality, you know what it is, yet you don't know what it is. But that's self-contradictory. But some things are better than others, that is, they have more quality. But when you try to say what that quality is, apart from the things that have it, it all goes poof. There's nothing to talk about. But if you can't say what quality is, how do you know that it even exists? If no one knows what it is, then for all practical purposes, it doesn't exist at all. But for all practical purposes, it does exist. What else are grades based on? Why else would people pay fortunes for some things and throw others in the trash pile? Obviously, some things are better than others. But what's the betterness? So round and round you go, spinning mental wheels and nowhere finding any place to get traction. What is quality? What is it? Well, this view is not without merit. The activities, objectives, and constituencies of higher education are very diverse. 
Thus, it is not surprising that academics find it quite difficult to agree upon what it is that colleges and universities are supposed to be doing and what it is that we seek to measure when we talk about quality and how it is that we propose to undertake that measurement. The longer one is associated with higher education, the more one becomes impressed with the fact that higher education is complex, subtle in its effects, and perhaps not always susceptible to empirical analysis. Now, the nihilist view of quality assessment must ultimately be rejected, I think, because in fact quality judgments are made daily by virtually everyone associated with higher education. Students select colleges, majors, courses, and instructors, even while they continually decide whether or not even to attend class. Professors assign grades to students and, as peers, judge each other's performance in the traditional duties of teaching, scholarly productivity, and service. Administrators accept or reject faculty recommendations on a myriad of subjects, most noticeably including the promotion and tenure of faculty. Regents, trustees, higher education commissioners, legislators, and federal officials similarly allocate scarce financial resources and dispense programmatic authority on bases that even cynics would agree occasionally include perceptions of the relative quality of various programs and academic institutions. Thus, I think it's factually incorrect to assert that quality judgments cannot be made or are not made. Whether explicitly or implicitly, quality judgments are intrinsic to higher education and are made constantly. The real question of import is whether or not these assessments of quality made on the firing line are any good. That is, whether they seem to be based upon theoretical propositions that are logically valid and for which there is more than a modicum of supporting empirical evidence. Weight in the balance, then, the nihilist's approach to quality judgments must be discarded as not constituting, I think, a sufficiently accurate description of the real world. Well, there's the reputational approach. Academics are not unlike others in society in their tendency, nay, I think their love, to rank each other's academic programs. At one time or another, the academic departments in nearly every academic discipline uh, have ranked uh, selected groups of programs and uh, selected universities in their own disciplines. An example in point is the recently published rankings of the academic programs housed in departments of mathematical and physical sciences. These rankings were given extensive public attention by virtue of being published in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which I suspect is the literary equivalent of the town crier in higher education. Not a little outcry greeted the publication of these rankings. Some argued that the rankings clearly exhibited what Salman has called the halo effect. That is, certain of the academic programs were actually not distinguished in character, but were located at prestigious universities, whose general excellence fortuitously spilled over upon this particular mediocre program. Thus, some would contend, for example, that not all academic programs at Harvard University are as distinguished as rankings often indicate. Still another criticism of reputational rankings is that they seldom accurately reflect the current status of an academic program. Rather, they reflect what was true five to ten years ago, or even what was true when the ranker was in graduate school, however long ago that was. There is little doubt but that there is a built-in lag in reputational rankings. Some academic programs and departments fail to receive appropriate recognition until long after they have achieved excellence. Others maintain a reputation based upon achievement or facts that were stale and out of date many moons ago, or by basking in the reflected glory of faculty members who have long since departed for other pastures. Perhaps I think the most penetrating criticism of quality rankings from the standpoint of institutions such as Ball State University is that they are nearly always based upon some combination of factors such as the perceived quality of the graduate, not the undergraduate programs that a department or institution might offer, the amount of published research generated by faculty in the major referee journals of the discipline, and, I think, the size of the department or academic institution, which is typically measured by the number of students, the number of degrees granted, the number of library volumes, or similar quantitative measures. Thus, Ball State University and similar institutions are seldom, if ever, cited in the polls that purport to list the academic programs and departments that exhibit the highest quality. An interesting exception is the recent ranking of the master's degree programs in health education, which placed Ball State's master's program at the very top of the heap nationally. But such rankings often implicitly assume that all institutions of higher education are or should be doing the same things. Institutions such as Ball State do have a graduate mission, 
However, our fundamental educational commitment continues to be to undergraduates. I would be the first, I think you know, to argue that scholarly research has much, much to do with the quality of education received by undergraduate students. Nonetheless, the raw number of refereed journal articles, like the number and size of our doctoral programs, is only imperfectly related to the effectiveness of our undergraduate instruction. For example, I believe that the effectiveness and validity of freshman writing courses, such as English 103, does not necessarily depend in any qualitative way upon the existence of our PhD degree program in English. Superior writing programs can and do exist at many institutions that offer no graduate work of any kind. I would argue, perforce, that an excellent writing program for new matriculates has more to do with the ultimate quality of our baccalaureate degree programs than do, than do any of the factors that seem to influence and determine the rankings of academic programs in entire academic institutions. The salient point, then, is that most reputational rankings of quality omit significant determinants of excellence and quality. Further, while such rankings may tell us something about how well an academic program or institution fulfill one particular vision of what constitutes quality of graduate programs, said rankings ignore the fact that the great mass of colleges and universities in the United States do not share this common mission and do not serve common constituencies. What constitutes quality at a community college located in Appalachia does not necessarily constitute quality at Princeton University. Differing missions and constituencies require differing measures of quality. Then there is the resource approach. There's also a persistent tendency in American higher education to associate quality with measures of the resources controlled by a particular academic program or institution. Thus, Barron's Profiles of American Colleges, a popular source book about the character and relative quality of academic institutions, reports, for every one of the institutions surveyed, a wealth of statistical information concerning such things as the mean student-faculty ratio, the percent of the faculty that hold a doctorate, the mean number of library volumes held by the institution, the mean salary levels of the faculty, the mean uh, or the median SAT and ACT scores of re recent entering students, and the number of applications received by the institution, along with the percentage of those applications that result in a denial of admission. At the front of the profiles is a section entitled An Explanation of the Book, in which Barron's offers its perceptions about what student-faculty ratios are necessary in order to, su to sustain quality, how many library volumes per student are appropriate, and so forth. The implication throughout is that there is a direct and positive relationship between these resource variables and the quality of education. But we need to examine very closely the notion that suggests that the quantity or even the quality of inputs is closely related to educational quality. At the very outset, we must assert that our major interest lies with the outputs of higher education and not with the inputs the same. One does not judge the efficiency of an operation on the basis of how many expensive resources that operation uses or squanders. Instead, one measures efficiency by asking, how much output have we generated by utilizing these resources? Or more precisely, how much output per unit of input have we actually received? Thus, we must center our attention not on the dollars that Yale University spends on its faculty, but rather on the educational output that Yale generates per dollar that it spends. It's reasonable to expect, it seems to me, that a college or university that has fine facilities, a highly qualified faculty, and intellectually gifted students will graduate students who will both be highly educated and highly successful in whatever future endeavors they choose to undertake. But that observation does not demonstrate to me that the institution in question is responsible for that end result. Students who are intelligent and highly motivated upon entry at IVU are almost a cinch to graduate from IVU still being intelligent and highly motivated. The real question is, what, if anything, did IVU do to improve the situation? How much knowledge did IVU do, uh, add to the students? How did it improve the situation? The foregoing discussion leads us to conclude that we will not ordinarily tell ourselves as much as we would like about quality if we concentrate upon the level and quality of educational inputs. We need to know something about the quantity and quality of educational outputs if we are to make a judgment about the quality 
of the educational process that we are attempting to judge. And that brings us to the outcomes approach. Quality measurement that concentrates upon the outputs of higher education is preferable to one that concentrates upon the inputs to higher education. Indeed, as Alexander Aston has noted, those who purport to make quality judgments about higher education increasingly point to outcome measures such as the basis for their inferences and conclusions. Accordingly, measures such as the number of Woodrow Wilson Fellow recipients who graduate from an institution, the proportion of an institution's graduates who are listed in who's who, the proportion of an institution's graduates who enter a graduate school who later receive a doctorate, or perhaps the lifetime earnings of a college or university's alumni, all of these may be referenced as the basis for conclusions that the outputs of a particular institution are of high quality. But all outcome measures of quality beg the most important question, namely, did this college or university really make a difference? Once again, we would expect Stanford, let's say, to graduate students who are gifted and ambitious. How much, however, did Stanford contribute to the success of its alumni? Would such individuals have been successful regardless of whether or not they had been given access to the richness and the resources of Stanford? That indeed, to me, is the relevant question, which is only indirectly addressed by quality measurement, which stresses either inputs or outputs to the exclusion of either. That brings us to the value-added approach. Support for a value-added approach to measuring educational effectiveness and quality has been growing in recent years. The value-added approach owes its intellectual existence to the discipline of economics, which has long utilized the concept of value-added to signify the difference between the value of output produced and the value of the inputs used to produce that output. For example, if inputs valued at $10 produce output valued at $12, then the value added of this particular productive process is $2. Now, in the context of higher education, value added relates to the incremental learning or incremental changes in behavior that occur because of higher education. An example in point is the 10 University Outcomes of General Education study that was recently concluded under the aegis of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. This study, of which Ball State was a part, attempted to determine if the general education programs of the 10 participating institutions substantively added to students' knowledge or changed their ability to think logically and to engage in critical thinking that requires skills such as analysis and synthesis. You will be pleased to know that the results strongly supported the hypothesis that our general education program at Ball State adds to student knowledge that it increases student openness and receptivity to listen to and evaluate new and, and different ideas, and that it enhances students' ability to think critically and logically. Now, all of this is good news, for if this were not so, we would have reason to question seriously why we support and maintain such a program. Thus, more than any other approach to the measurement of quality, the value-added approach measures whether or not we are really effective. The value-added approach can also dispose of some shibboleths about precisely which institutions of higher education are the most effective in educating their students and adding to those students' stock of knowledge. As Aston has pointed out in his volume, Four Critical Years, which is a survey of various empirical studies that relate to the effect of effects of baccalaureate education on students, several studies suggest that the value-added of prestigious Ivy League institutions is surprisingly small. A Harvard may graduate brilliant students. However, it also admitted brilliant students four years previously. The apparent changes in student knowledge, attitudes, and ability to reason that can be attributed to Harvard is not as large as the comparable changes that are observed at institutions such as Ball State. Well, what does this say to us about quality? Well, it might cause us to conclude that in a time when educational dollars are scarce, that the ball states of the educational world are a better investment for society than are the Harvards of the world. The reasoning is simple. We get more output per dollar invested at Ball State than we do for a comparable dollar invested at Harvard. Yet, employers might well prefer to hire a Harvard graduate rather than a Ball Stater because the absolute level of achievement and ability for a typical Harvard Yard product probably exceeds that of the typical Hoosier who graduates from good old Ball U. Further, you as a, as a prospective student 
might well prefer to attend Harvard because one of the social and economic functions of Harvard is to act as a screening device for society. Individuals who can be admitted to Harvard and succeed there are very likely to be both intelligent and motivated. Further, they are likely to earn much higher than average incomes. Thus, your acquisition of a Harvard diploma is a powerful advertisement about your abilities and motivation. But note that it is not necessarily an advertisement that Harvard will have added more to your knowledge, attitudes, and ability to think than would have Ball State if Ball State's extensive resources were utilized selectively. We must be careful not to confuse the ability of Harvard graduates to earn high incomes with the ability of Harvard University to have a high value added in the sense that I've defined that term today. Now the key to this paradox, if it is one, is that most contemporary notions of what constitutes quality in educational institutions and in, and in individual programs stress either the amount and quality of educational inputs or the absolute level of educational outputs. The value-added approach, on the other hand, stresses improvement and asks, in addition, how much improvement has occurred per unit of input. The latter proviso is crucially important since a particular mode of instruction, say computer-assisted instruction, might be highly effective in a value-added sense but nonetheless be prohibitively expensive. Since our financial and physical resources are severely constrained, we must look for the most efficient way to accomplish a given end. This implies that we must, in one way or another, evaluate the value added per dollar of competing approaches, and then, ceteris paribus, select that approach that promises the greatest value added per dollar. Now, to be sure, the advent of a value added approach to quality measurement will require a significant reorientation of the conventional educational thinking patterns. This is especially true, I think, because higher education has still not adjusted to the new world of severely constrained budgets and falling enrollments. Both administrators and faculty resist the weeding out of extraneous or questionable programs, even while they propose new and often exciting ways to expend additional resources. The pension in higher education is to add new programs but seldom to eliminate less viable programs. Significant programmatic deletions are rare at any university. And when they do occur, for example, the elimination of the Department of Geography at the University of Michigan, they are accorded national publicity. As a consequence, there has been a strong trend to spread the thin jam of academic resources over an increasingly large slice of bread. Such a procedure, many believe, is a good recipe for widespread mediocrity as opposed to selective excellence. The value-added approach then stresses that not all educational institutions and not all academic programs are either equally effective or equally good investments. The value-added approach also stresses that educators must attempt to measure the incremental outputs of higher education so that intelligent decisions can be made about the use of scarce resources. The ultimate aim is to maximize the quality of educational programs, however we choose to measure them. Lewis Salmon, the noted UCLA higher education researcher, has recently argued that the value, that value added as a concept must be brought to the fore in quality assessments. From the tenor of my remarks today, you can easily infer that I agree with Professor Salmon. I believe, for example, that we need to do much more pre-testing and post-testing of students at Ball State in an effort to ascertain if we really have had significant value added. We need to spend more time specifying the specific outcomes that we wish to produce by means of the educational process in which we are involved, and then made, make major attempts to determine if we have actually produced those outcomes and, I think, at what cost. Now, those of you in the audience who know that my academic training is in the field of economics or who have personally taken a bit of coursework in economics will recognize that what I'm calling for, in fact, is the application of the logic of the discipline of economics to some of our decisions about higher education quality and effectiveness. Now, recognition of that fact may be sufficient to some, send some of you off to pack your bags right now. Nonetheless, I think that the logic and methods of inquiry in the field of economics have a great deal to offer us as we grapple with the identification and measurement of quality. Next section of my uh, talk is entitled Actions on the Home Front and deals essentially with, well, what can we do here at Ball State? It's one thing to talk about how to measure excellence and quality. It's yet another thing to attempt to provide the conditions that will cause them to occur. 
It's long been my position that a majority of the things that are necessary to induce and maintain quality in a higher education are in fact, are in fact things that we ourselves control. That is, a surprising amount of our own destiny is within our, our own control insofar as the nurture and maintenance of quality are concerned. For example, it is we who establish and make meaningful our admission and retention standards for students, not the state of Indiana. It is we who must establish what it is that we expect of our professorial colleagues here at Ball State. The state of Indiana has remarkably little effect upon such matters. Let me address the matter of our campus expectations for performance on the part of faculty colleagues. Both existing research and casual observations suggest strongly that our shared value system and our expectations of faculty members are many times more important in, in determining what those faculty members do than the specific resources that we give them to support their work. Thus, the direction of colleagues that good teaching is essential or that published research in reputable refereed journals is required seem to be more important in generating these things than our reduced teaching loads or graduate assistant support. I am reminded of a department that I visited at another university. During that visit, I asked, it, I asked a faculty member in full listening range of his colleagues, what are you working on these days? Well, this is a common question in good institutions and among industrious academics. The answer usually is, oh, my notes for a new course that I'm teaching in econometrics or perhaps, hey, I have a new book contract with Little Brown and the first draft manuscript is due on April 1st. But this faculty member, however, replied, the roof of my house, I'm redoing it. Well, this faculty member's response told me worlds about him and about his department, for not a single one of his colleagues snickered or were offended at this response. As it happened, many of his departmental colleagues were operating businesses on the side. This department habitually gave each of its faculty members the same salary raise each year, regardless of the disparity of individual performance between and among these faculty. This department may have said that it was interested in excellence and quality, but its actions suggested otherwise. So what we expect of each other is crucially important in, in determining what we actually do. This generality applies not only to the academic world, but also to athletes and bricklayers and politicians. When we expect little, we typically receive little in return. It was Alexander Pope who once observed, blessed he is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. We must, I think, risk occasional disappointment in academe. Standards that all can satisfy are not the road to excellence and to quality. Some of the most outstanding colleges and universities in the world have shabby physical facilities, grievously low funding, and questionable public support. This is especially true in many European countries. But the faculty and students in such institutions hold a shared value system about the nature and purpose of higher education and about the need for excellence. Students do not graduate who do not exhibit excellence. Faculty are not promoted and tenured without demonstrating that they have made substantial contributions to their respective disciplines. In this regard, let me recite research that indicates, once again, that reducing a faculty member's teaching load in order to stimulate research output apparently does not often have that effect. There is, inside particular campuses, almost no correlation between teaching loads and the research output of faculty. Those faculty who believe that research is a necessary integral part of their responsibility will do research, even when they have heavy teaching responsibilities. The converse is also apparently true. Faculty who know that good teaching is expected and that it will be rewarded tend to provide such even when research expectations are quite high. Thus, it is apparently the case that we need to look a bit more at ourselves and a bit less to the state of Indiana than sometimes we have previously thought in order to increase quality at Ball State. Now, I think there are some very specific things that we can do here at Ball State to set the stage for the enhancement of quality. Permit me to mention a few. Admission standards. The three most salient historical facts pertaining to admission standards at Ball State are, in my opinion, the fact that we are a public institution, the fact that the state of Indiana traditionally has required a master's degree of all teachers in its public elementary and secondary systems, and the fact that the state of Indiana has never developed a comprehensive junior and community college system. 
Each of these three facts has been important in developing a tradition of relatively free and open admission standards at Ball State. You must be aware that this tradition has in recent years begun to change, if not to disappear. Why? Well, first, there is abundant empirical evidence that extremely heterogeneous student bodies are difficult to teach and that the learning that occurs in a classroom in which there are vastly different levels of student ability present is usually not as high as the learning that occurs in classrooms or in teaching situations where student abilities are more uniform. Further, students who are admitted, even though they show or have little likelihood of success, sometimes become embittered and as Vice President for Student Affairs M.C. Byrell has often observed, become disruptive and destructive in our residence halls. In a sense, such students have been lured onto the campus by false advertising that did not stress sufficiently the nature and requirements of academic life. But probably the most important reasons why our admission standards have changed are financial in character. In some disciplines, for example, in architecture and in nursing, we simply do not have sufficient slots available to serve all of the qualified students who would like to come to Ball State. Hence, we must ration the available slots by awarding them to the most qualified students. Now, it's also true, however, that we have found the various kinds of remedial instruction that we undertake at Ball State, for example, an English 102 course, to be quite expensive relative to other forms of instruction and programs. The cost per credit hour of a remedial course is almost 50% higher than that of a non-remedial section of the same course because, usually, class sizes are smaller, special instructors and support are needed, and sometimes there's significant overhead associated with these programs. Thus, despite the fact that we have and maintain and will continue a strong social commitment to, to the provision of an AOP-type program, and even in the light of the tremendous success of that program, it is not the type of program that we can undertake without limit, without also forcing ourselves to sacrifice too many other good things that are probably essential to our educational enterprise. It should be of interest to you, however, to know that the available empirical evidence indicates that the existence of significant admission standards attracts students. Not only do such admission standards arguably increase internal quality as per the arguments just stated, but also significant admission standards are a signal to external publics that an institution is concerned with quality. I will note parenthetically that I am now working with a sample of some 2,000 colleges and universities and am attempting by means of regression analysis to explain the number of applicants and enrollees at these institutions in the year 1980. The preliminary results indicate that admissions rigor seems to attract students. Holding the price and location of a college or university constant, students prefer an institution that they believe will offer them the most quality for their investment. Our admissions policies, then, may be the most important single way in which we communicate with the citizens of the state of Indiana about the nature of our institution. When a student of very low abilities applies to Ball State and is admitted, we transmit a subtle message to parent citizens, high school counselors, and high school principals about the character of Ball State. Similarly, when some prospective graduate student finds out that something more than simply a bachelor's degree is required for admission to the graduate school and that a master's degree is not a right, we generate a message to the citizenry that is highly beneficial. People seldom value that which is given away. Let me next talk about retention standards at Ball State. Most public institutions of higher education have admission standards that refuse admission to certain classes of students. In some cases, however, admission is relatively free and any high school graduate may obtain admission to a public four-year institution. There is some evidence that the state of Indiana has in the past encouraged this model even though there has been a noticeable move away from free admission at several Indiana public institutions, including Ball State. But a relatively open door for admissions purposes need not mean, and I would argue should not mean, free and easy retention and exit standards. Free access must not be allowed to dictate free exit. The meaning of a baccalaureate degree must not be debased simply because it is the state's policy to provide most of its citizens with the opportunity for higher education. There is no surer way to ruin the public's regard for higher education and higher education's value than to maintain low academic standards. 
Quality maintenance in higher education means that we must insist that baccalaureate degree recipients demonstrate their possession of certain skills, for example, the ability to communicate, especially in writing, that degree recipients acquire an appreciation of their cultural roots and the world around them, that they be broadly and liberally educated and that they understand the basic modes of scholarly inquiry, for example, the scientific method and that in many cases they also have acquired vocational skills that will lead to specific employment. Let me here add, though, that this last result is icing on the cake and should not be the motivating reason why individuals become educated. To me, it is dishonest for a college or university to label someone an educated individual if it's apparent that said individual has little understanding of the world around him or her and cannot write coherent paragraphs. Thus, excellence and quality in higher education require that whatever our admission standards might be, that we not adulterate our product. One is not magically educated simply because one has received a diploma. We must insist that rigorous standards be maintained in higher education, all the more so in the light of declining enrollments and the tendency of some institutions to relax previous standards in an attempt to guarantee or maintain their current size. There is nothing intrinsically good or bad about any given level of a student enrollment. For example, 18,200 students at Ball State. Ball State might conceivably be a better institution if it registered only 16,000 students. There are excellent institutions of higher education that enroll less than 1,000 students. There are excellent institutions that claim 40,000 students. Size, then, is not the measure of excellence. What we do with our students and what we require of them is, the siren song of maintaining institutional size may be one of the major barriers to quality maintenance during the 1980s. Talk for a moment about curriculum and grading. One of my foremost mentors, President David Sweet of Rhode Island College, once observed that there are probably three curriculums at any university. The first curriculum is that which is found and described in the university catalog. The second is that actually taught by the faculty who can and do alter catalog descriptions to fit their interests or events of the day. The third curriculum, however, is what students actually take in terms of courses and what they actually learn in those courses. It is this third curriculum that is crucial to the production of educated individuals and the maintenance of quality. Let me provide an example. The current general studies program at Ball State requires a student to complete at least 20 quarter hours in the general area of sciences and mathematics. A closer inspection reveals, however, that it is quite possible for a student to complete that section of our general studies program and eventually to graduate without either taking a mathematics course or demonstrating any proficiency in mathematics. Apparently, many students have realized that this possibility exists as well, for many opt to take no mathematics at all. Well, the moral to this story is simple. We must analyze what courses students actually take and what they actually learn in those courses. The most beautiful curriculum in the world will have little useful effect if it's not enforced or the standards that exist for satis satisfying that curriculum are too low. Quality educational institutions, then, must increasingly examine what actually happens as a result of their educational programs and not sim simply compile a list of courses that their graduates may or may not choose to take. Once again, the value-added approach to ascertaining the existence of educational quality seems to provide considerable hope, for it is capable of telling whether or not students who graduate from Ball State actually have any knowledge in the area of mathematics, whether or not they took a mathematics course at Ball State. The matter of grading is, of course, intimately related to curriculum. Stated in terms of the value-added concept, grading amounts to assigning a meaningful label to indicate the presence of learning or of value-added. Lax grading standards are ordinarily an indication that the level of student learning is either unknown or perhaps rather low. In this regard, the large and statistically significant rise in student grade point averages that occurred in the late 60s and early 1970s was, I think, the result of a loss in confidence on the part of many individuals in higher education, especially professors, that they really were accomplishing anything. It should not surprise us that a professor who doubts that his value added is very high might also be reluctant to distinguish between and among students in terms of grades. After all, why penalize students if the process itself makes little if any difference? 
let me step into a potential quagmire by suggesting to you that my own casual empiricism reveals that high, nearly uniform grades are most often, in my experience anyway, assigned in courses where content is minimal, learning is small, and the student audience is sometimes more interested in the accumulation of credits than in education. Promotion, tenure, and salary standards also affect quality. Whether or not we like it, we must confess that students occupy a transitory role in higher education. The typical baccalaureate degree recipient spends four to five years on a campus and then leaves, perhaps never to return. But the faculty remains, even more so than administrators who often are individuals who have considerable mobility. It is the long-term continuing interests of faculty members that cause them to dominate the academy. They can simply outlast students and administrators. Viewed in this light, it's not difficult to accept Cardinal Newman's perhaps apocryphal observation that the faculty is the university. For it is indeed the faculty that determine the tone of the university over any extended period of time. Students can, and they have had, impact on the goals and operation of academic institutions. Administrators make lay claim to the same, particularly as they endure in the identical position for a decade or more. But neither of these groups remotely approaches the faculty in terms of long-term impact upon the direction and the mood of an institution. The most enduring place where faculty direction of an academic institution is felt is in peer deliberations concerning the promotion, tenure, and salary increments assigned faculty. It is there more than any other place that the faculty sets the tone and expectations of the institution. It is here that both new and existing faculty are guided, directed, rewarded, and even sometimes punished. It is here that common sets of institutional values and standards are formed. Whatever faculty members assert that they favor or support, it is when they make a promotion, a tenure, or a salary decision concerning their colleagues that the rubber actually meets the road. Father Hesburgh of the University of Notre Dame has demonstrated that one can reshape an institution fundamentally over a period of years if one has faculty support to do so. Notre Dame has moved in a quarter century from the status of a relatively undistinguished Midwestern institution known almost solely for its football team to a nationally renowned institution of demonstrated excellence. No longer does the tail of the football team wag the Notre Dame University dog. But note that this was accomplished by instituting, among other things, tightened promotion and tenure standards and a faculty salary system based upon evaluated faculty performance. The faculty at Notre Dame was willing to make judgments about itself and to deny promotion, tenure, and salary increments to those faculty members who did not exhibit excellence. To be sure, there were cries of opposition along the way. However, in my opinion, the results speak for themselves. Earlier in this paper, I pointed out the imitative nature of faculty relationships. When new faculty members see that older, more established members of the department are gaining fame as antique salesmen, or that these senior statement, statesmen are gaining recognition as real estate agent of the month, this sends one message. When, by contrast, they see a community of scholars that is concerned about its teaching and actively engaged in research and publication, quite another message is sent. Similarly, the tone that is established in a department where everyone receives the same percentage salary increment regardless of their performance is quite different from the tone that leads a department where salary increments are one, anyway, visible means of demonstrating what it is that the department values and what it stands for in terms of academic performance. It will suffice for me to assert that very few institutions of higher education of recognized quality refuse to make salary differentiations between and among faculty over extended periods of time. Virtually none promote and tenure automatically or without significant evidence of superior performance on the part of the faculty candidate. Finally, let me note that the maintenance and reward of quality are obviously easier when one has lots of money to utilize to support these attempts. Additional money and resources can cure a host of institutional problems and sores. Yet I return to the conclusion that the standards of performance that we impose upon ourselves are often more important than the level of generosity of a state government. This is a lesson that we too often skip by when we talk about how it is that we will generate excellence in higher education. A few final thoughts. If there existed unanimity 
in higher education concerning the definition and origins of academic excellence and a consensus concerning issues such as how to measure it and how to nurture it and sustain it, then there would have been little reason for me to give this speech this afternoon. Like many other complex issues in higher education, there is more than one view. Now you have a synopsis of my views on these matters. It is my hope that I have been persuasive. But whether or not that's been the case is now time to reverse the process and to deal with your thoughts and questions. Thanks for listening. Do you feel that there's a climate at Ball State to do some of the things that you've mentioned today? Well, I think my answer to that is yes, Wally. I, I sense uh, a growing sense of direction at Ball State in terms of who we are and who we would like to be. And um, as I've remarked many times in different forums, when you go to a Big Ten institution or a land-grant institution, they have a stated purpose and function, and people seem to know what it is. Similarly, you go to a junior college, or a community college, and people seem to know what they do. It is the in-between institutions, the former teachers' colleges, that many times have been searching over the last years and decades to find out, well, what is our, our, our role in higher education? What are we supposed to be doing? And I sense at Ball State a growing consensus that what we ought to be doing is not trying to be as large as we could and not trying to, let's say, have the same size of a Purdue or an Illinois, but rather that whatever the size is that we have, we ought to try to be very, very good and that we have some distinctives. For example, our faculty teach. We don't simply push graduate assistants and uh, doctoral fellows in consistently to teach. Uh, we have a very strong system of student services. If we combine that with an interest in quality and really not only have the perception but the reality of quality, I think we're going to find that uh, not only will there be lots of people at Ball State who unite behind that kind of notion, but there were going to be very, very attractive out there to prospective students who would like to come here. So yeah, I think there's a, a rather good uh, foundation for these kinds of things at Ball State. Uh, uh, and as Bob Bell said just this morning, he said, you know, in so many ways, we've got so many good programs going that uh, maybe it's time to now talk about us as a, mature, as a mature institution rather than one that's always maturing or always on the way. In many ways, we've arrived. Yes, sir. I think that uh, most everyone is concerned with quality, but we're really concerned with who's going to, to, to decide what is quality or what is excellence. In uh, public administration, from the public administration review, for example, a recent issue several, year, several years ago said that one person's merit is another person's favoritism. One person's excellence is another person's unreasonable requirement. Given that kind of, of, of a predicament, who is going to decide here at this institution what is quality? Who is going to decide here at this institution what is quality? Well, I think there can be virtually only one answer to that, and that is the faculty. As I suggested in my talk, the faculty ultimately set the tone of the institution. And provosts and deans and so forth can uh, stomp their feet and yell and scream, but ultimately is the Department of Political Science colleagues are going to determine essentially what goes on there. And so I think my answer has to be ultimately it is faculty colleagues and individual departments that will make those decisions and set the tone. Now, I can, as I am here today and frequently do other times, go out and try to preach my particular brand of the gospel. But uh, I've been around long enough by now to realize that uh, it's not necessarily so that anyone's going to listen or believe. And uh, people who are already out there in departments, uh, who are out in the trenches uh, doing the daily teaching and research, those are the people who make the, the really meaningful decisions and distinctions about what quality is or is not. At most, uh, I can be like the politician who maybe finds out where the people is going and then uh, leads them there. Uh, I can have some leadership function as an administrator, but uh, again, I have to place the emphasis on the faculty as being the continuing force that decides that.
Other questions? Yes, sir? Yes. What do you see as some of the greatest forces impeding this vision you have of, of quality at Ball State? Without mentioning names. What are the greatest? Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> Got a little What's worried. keeping us from the kind of quality you want to have? What's keeping us from the quality <clears throat> that's desired? Well, let me mention several things. One that occurs to me immediately and uh, is obvious to anyone who comes from another campus to here is we don't oftentimes think very good things about ourselves. There are a lot of good things going on at Ball State that we don't recognize and that we refuse to really give ourselves credit for. So I think uh, in the first instance, we've got to be willing to admit to ourselves that some of the things that we're doing are very good and that it's not necessary that, let's say, we duplicate what's going on at Indiana University to be an excellent uh, academic institution. We're a different kind of institution. Uh, a second thing that I will say is that uh, I have never been on any campus where there was something like the faculty handbook, which was so thick and so involved. Uh, we have incorporated more governance and more procedures and rules and regulations into that kind of a volume than I've ever seen before. I came from a campus that had collective bargaining. The entire collective bargaining contract was like this, and our faculty handbook's like that. Uh, it is possible to do things then in a different way. Uh, I think sometimes we've been overly prescriptive in our governance and that uh, we look in the handbook and we find out that there's a rule that pertains to nearly everything. And so sometimes we find out that we don't have freedom to do some things. For example, it is still in our faculty handbook that in order for any faculty member to obtain a research load, at least according to the handbook anyway, the department chairman, the dean, the provost, and the president all have to approve. Well, I don't think that that happens very often, and I almost hope that it doesn't happen, but it's an example of something that's probably out of date and uh, I would suggest that uh, there are a lot of things in the handbook that were appropriate to Ball State Teachers College prior to 1965 or even a growing state college, but we're Ball State University now and in so many ways are mature, and the handbook just doesn't allow us to get some of the places that I think probably we need to go. Additional questions? Okay, at this time, oh, yes, sir? If we have more time, I'll have more questions. We, we have time. We've got five minutes. Uh, let me offer a perception, and that is that labor really doesn't have any role in the overall direction of this campus. And I, when I say labor, I mean faculty. That uh, most of our decisions, uh, most of the major decisions are done by management, our salary, uh, our negotiations are done by management. As long as, and I'm not speaking about organized labor, I, you know, as, as long as labor does not have more of an input in terms of the overall direction, how can we really hold labor accountable as we should? How can we hold labor accountable as we should? That's good. Well, John, I think the first thing that I would quarrel with is the labor management distinction. Um, surely that exists in a collective bargaining situation such as that that I came from, but uh, here's old Jim Cook who's taught a course every quarter that he's been here except one, and you know, I've got five hours of teaching right now, and I'd like to think, uh, many may not believe it, but that I'm simply a person, a faculty colleague who happens to be assigned to an administrative role for a period of time, and then I will go back and be a faculty member. And I think that it's uh, probably not a good idea to think of administrators as somebody who are lifetimers and so forth. Uh, that may have been possible in tamer and less uh, rambunctious times, but I think probably uh, for most administrators, uh, they will work uh, whatever wonders they are going to work within a somewhat shorter time, within five or ten years, and then they ought to think about giving someone else a chance at that or allowing someone else to come in with their new and, and fresh ideas. So. Uh, I think probably that I don't think myself so much as a manager as I do think of myself as a colleague who, when he was uh, in a department of economics, uh, teaching full-time and doing research full-time, said, by golly, if I were in that kind of position, here's what I'd do, and now I'm in that position, and these are the kinds of things that I used to think about trying to do, and I'll find out that some of these ideas were harebrained. 
or that it can't be done quite that easily, but basically the kinds of things that I'm attempting to do as an, as an administrator and my emphasis on quality and standards and the like are directly related to the thoughts I had as a faculty member. Uh, now, having said that, I would agree with you that on a lot of the things that we do at Ball State University, direct faculty participation seems to be minimal. Uh, some of those things I think we need to work on and, and that we can help ourselves out on. In other areas, though, we have to recognize the, na the nature of the state budget process and so forth and realize that uh, sending a committee down to the governor's office or whatever is ordinarily not the most auspicious way to negotiate a budget or to get certain things to happen. Uh, I'll mention without much comment our new computer sciences mathematics English building. That didn't was not included in our original budget request for the previous year, yet we got it. Now, let me suggest that that happened in a certain fashion and uh, with a certain negotiating process that uh, maybe isn't conducive to a committee or a group of faculty colleagues being uh, uh, involved in. But uh, I think, for example, uh, a group such as our Finance Council ought to be maybe more active than it is now in terms of inspecting how it is that we do things and uh, where our priorities are and uh, how do we propose to finance one thing. Uh, I think our curriculum committees repeatedly have passed new programs and new courses without asking how we're going to pay for them. When we don't have any new faculty members coming on and we add new courses or a new program, what are we going to give up? Well, I think our faculty-dominated curriculum committees ought to be asking those kinds of questions because those are really fundamental. Uh, what I observe is that in a lot of cases, faculty have more or less, hmm. by default, given that decision to the administration. Uh, give you another example, uh, reduction in force policy. I'm glad to see that Dave Richmond picked up my suggestion and that he's going to try to get the University Senate working on a reduction in force policy because in the absence of that, uh, the administration or the Board of Trustees uh, would if they were forced to it, you know, to act without having uh, extensive faculty input. So uh, I think there's some things we can do on this campus, but we also have to recognize in terms of how it is that the budget process works and so forth that some of those things are not conducive to your being involved or even my being involved. I found out about a lot of these things later because that's the nature of the process. Yes, sir. Um, I would be interested in your view with regard to how much people can change. That is, if I could pick a book right now, it would be one, here are faculty who were forlorn, unproductive, who, because they were held in rank for 10 years or 20 years, are now productive and uh, charismatic characters. That, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, um, I really don't know how much people can change. And uh, I, I think it has something to do with uh, how much they think they can change. But I, I'm not sure that a penalty system uh, brings about the results that, that, that we would hope it might bring about. Okay, how, does the, how can the faculty change? And does a penalty system bring about this change? Well, I think I would place more emphasis on rewards and incentives than I would on penalties. But I do think there are cases out there where given sets of colleagues need occasionally to be chastised. And I don't think that's very often the case, but I think there are instances that arise where somebody is simply not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, having said that, it seems to me that what we need to do is think in terms of there not being a single academic model for faculty that we ought to have faculty members who specialize and have a comparative advantage in a lot of different things. Some will be more interested in research than others. Some will be more interested in service and so forth, and that we ought to have an institution which is capable of honoring and incorporating all those models. Now, I still think, having said that, though, in addition, that uh, that doesn't mean that someone could only be interested in research and pay no attention to teaching, or I think vice versa. There is some complementarity uh, of those two kinds of things, or even we might include services three, that we need a balanced faculty member, but I see no reason why a faculty member might hypothetically 
not be allowed to choose whether or not teaching would be weighted as low as, let's say, 40% or as high as 90% of someone's responsibilities. But we ought to uh, allow a lot of faculty members out there to essentially uh, dictate or set the weights that they would place on different things. Uh, and then we ought to have a system which admittedly might include some punishments on occasion, but mostly is a, a set of incentives and rewards saying, gee, uh, we can make life exciting for you by helping you retrain or by sending you out to graduate school for a year or giving you a, a special leave or paying for uh, you to go to a particular meeting or whatever. Uh, I think most faculty members are basically good people. They're basically people who are committed to higher education and that presented with the opportunity to go off and, and renew themselves, to retread, to uh, do exciting things, they'll do it. And most of them you don't need to take a club to. Most of them don't need to be punished. And in fact, for most of them, if they're punished, they'll react rather negatively. Uh, but there, again, there is a class of individuals for whom punishment is the only thing because they are simply not doing their jobs. At this time, we're going to serve refreshments. If you have additional questions, you're welcome to address the provost then. Thank you.